And now I'd like Murray Fletcher to come forward. Uh, Murray's got a story to tell, um, and I'll leave it entirely up to him, but Murray's a rusted on aviator who's been mixed up with flying for as long as I can remember. <laughs> and um, he's got an interesting story to tell you about uh, some aspects of World War II. Over to you, Murray. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. I'm going to tell you a story about two young men who found themselves at age about 21 fighting one another for their country uh, where they really didn't want to be. But nevertheless, uh, that's how they found themselves. Before we, I start the story, I want you to have a look. That's, uh, that's my painting there. It's not a painting, it's a print, original print. Uh, original print, one of the uh, uh, restricted print of a, photo, a, a painting that was done by uh, a well-known uh, artist, American artist, called Rick Herter. And you'll probably notice, uh, most of you probably recognise, it's an ME-109, the basic fighter aircraft that, that, uh, that really did all the work in Africa and Italy and a lot of other places. And that was a P-38 Lockheed Lightning. I suggest to you that when you finish, come up and have a look. There's a wonderful little sketch that was done for me by the guy who was piloting that aircraft. Now you probably say, so what? That's uh, that is a nice photo, uh, nice painting. But I guess any painter worth his salt can be given a photograph of those two aircraft and can paint that painting. Would you be right? They could. You could even say that. Uh, today, with all the restoration that are happening around the world, that you could possibly see those two aircraft flying together. But when I tell you that that depicts a, an incident that happened in July 1943, uh, and that is the coast of Sicily coming up, so that, I think that puts a different light on that painting. There's a, it, it's quite a story. I'm going to just click through a couple and show you the military situation that had happened. The uh, Rommel had been booted out of uh, Tunisia and the, the Americans had shifted most of their aircraft assets up on a here in the top end of Cis, uh, Tunisia because they could then attack Sicily and of course the foot of I Italy. Now, they always used to travel. The German aircraft that were still there were mainly massed in that area. So when they flew, they used to go around here. And of course, Palermo was the main shipping area for the Germans. Now, at that time, the Americans and the British had landed here at the base of Sicily and were forcing the Germans up and the Germans were taking a pretty bad beating. And they were trying to get their assets off the top, out of Palermo, and, uh, and, and of course out of Italy as well. So that just gives you an idea why, how could you see those two aircraft, and there's where the site is, they were approaching the coast there. So before we, uh, have a at the story. I want to, I'm going to talk to you about the two pilots. The German pilot was a guy by the name of Karl Münster. There is a little bit of doubt about the spelling of his name because it was only ever heard in a German accent and was never seen written. He was a lieutenant. He was, uh, at the time of this incident, he was just 21. He was a very well-trained pilot, uh, highly efficient pilot. Very, he was building up a very large a number of uh, destroyed uh, Allied aircraft. He was a superb fighter pilot. We don't know a lot else about him. The American pilot we do know quite a bit about. 
Lieutenant Frederick Cohn, his name was at that time. He changed his name later to Arnold, and, you're, and uh, so I'm going to call him Frederick Arnold because that's who, how I know him as today. Frederick, in when the uh, when America was dragged into the war by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Frederick was 18 years old. He was a young Jewish lad from Chicago, and he was a very gift, gifted artist himself. And he was working at a, a, uh, a newspaper in Chicago as a photo retoucher. His family was in pretty bad way. His father was very seriously ill will with uh, Parkinson's disease and had not been able to work for a few years. Uh, Frederick was earning $20 a week and his elder brother was earning $17.50 a week and that's what the whole family survived on. Their family savings had gone and uh, so the two boys were keeping the family together. Anyway, Fred was ordered by the editor to deface a photograph of the President of the United States and he flatly refused because they were going to print a, a derogatory story about him. Fred refused and he was suddenly kicked out the door. Now they had $17.50 a week to live on. And uh, Fred was a bit worried about this. But anyway, he'd seen an ad where it said, Become a fighter pilot for the United States Army Air Force. We'll pay you $187 a month. Now that was over twice what Fred would get it anyway. And uh, so he thought, well, that was his motivation. Twice the amount of money, I could keep my dad and mum in much better circumstances. I'll give it a go. So he went, immediately went to reply, apply and he was accepted he was just five foot nine, and five foot nine was the limit, and he just scraped, scraped in as a fighter pilot and started his trading. That's the aircraft that he first started on, and he had, not many of you will know that's a, 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 a Stearman, and uh, a Boeing Stearman. That particular aircraft is stationed here in Western Australia. It's beautifully restored and flies wonderfully. Unfortunately, I've never had the chance to get into it. But that's the aircraft that he first started his training on. Around about, I think, a 400 horse engine or a little less, uh, but a wonderful machine to fly. He then went on to this fellow, the Volti MT-13. Yes. The guys decided that they'd call it a Volti vibrator <laughs> because it vibrated so much in the air and these were young men with lots of testosterone flushing around in their system and no access to young ladies because they were training so hard and that vibration could do things to their body that stopped them from concentrating on what they were doing and they often got lost. So that's why they got lost uh, because of the Volti vibrator. Then they went on to that wonderful machine. It's not upside, uh, uh, the photograph is not upside down. You can see it, in, in the aircraft is upside down, so we'll turn it up the other way. And if you have a look at the guy in the front seat, you may recognise him. That's, that was a, that's an SNJ-6, uh, but the, uh, the T-6 Texan was the basic, advanced trainer for the, the American Air Force at that time and they trained on that aircraft. Now, 450, no, 550 horsepower, I think, was the great, the, the largest air engine they'd handled. They'd never flown a twin before, never even ridden in a twin before, and when they finished that, they were bundled into that. Now, nine and a half ton, uh, of uh, fighter aircraft with 1,500 horses on either side and a single seat. No dual seat training here, pal. You get it and you fly. 
They did their training on the ground with a with an instructor sitting on the wing, and uh, he just told them what to do. And once they could taxi it, once they knew where everything was, away they went to do their their uh, uh, their solo. Now, you know, if you think about that happening now, it would be the greatest laugh. Uh, it was the laugh was very serious. The first four of them, oh, while, while we're talking about that aircraft, I'm going to go back, just, I'm just going to go back and talk about that day that photograph was taken. I was in that one, as you could see, and my friend uh, who was with me was in another one that was almost painted with brown and black. We took off together, we took down one another's photographs, and then we split up. And he's a Qantas captain, and he was pretty keen on aerobatics, and he would have run his aeroplane out a fair bit. I did a few little things, but I'm not, I, I was never very, my tummy didn't like aerobatics a great deal, so I just do, did a few, uh, a few loops and, uh, and a couple of rolls, and, and then we joined back again and came back and landed. 23 days later, the aircraft he was flying the wing detached and the young man that was in with him that day and another man were both killed. So that was just a little uh, thing that happened uh, that we were very lucky not to be involved in. Getting back to this aircraft, this particular aircraft is called Glacier Girl. It's not the one that Fred would fly, but it's called Glacier Girl. There were five P-38s being escorted by a mothership uh, uh, B-17 that were flying over Greenland. They ran into bad weather and they all ditched onto the snow. They were there for 11 days before they were recovered. The aircraft stayed there. In 1992, when I went over my first trip to Oshkosh, they had most of that aircraft. They drilled down through 250 feet of ice a big hole, and they disassembled the aircraft in the hole, brought it up, and they had all the burst bits at Oshkosh that year in 1992. It's now a beautiful aircraft flying, and it's uh, 90, I think it was 92 or 93 percent of the original parts were used in the restoration. It's a magnificent thing to see. Let's uh, go, yeah, let me go back. We're now talking about their training on the P P38. It was right out in the, in the middle of the desert in a lonely place where there's just a few, few uh, buildings and a whole row of these things, which was, at that time, it was the greatest piece of equipment that the Americans had. It's got a cannon and four, cannon and four, machine guns in the front, and the thing about it was that they were facing, they were parallel and facing directly forward. So it was a wonderful gun platform. You didn't have to guess when you were far enough or close enough to the other aircraft to get your guns firing into the same spot. Didn't matter how far you were away, as long as you allowed for the movement of the other aircraft, you could blow him out of the sky. And they were a very wonderful gun platform. They were also a very good dive bomber. They did have some trouble pulling them out. They lost a few guys who left it a bit long. But they were very, very greatly used as a dive bomber. So come the day that the first four of this class were ready for their solo. Four of them. They taxi out, four aircraft, out the taxiway, sitting next to the runway. Freddie was the second one. The young guy, in, uh, in the front aircraft, his instructor sitting on the wing, says, right mate, it's your turn, away you go. Remember, lift off at 120, get your gear up, get some air, throw it around a bit and then come back and land. So the young guy pulled the hood down, taxied out, lined up, and remember, these guys hadn't even had the opportunity to open the engines up to know what it felt like. 
to open those engines up. He opened the taps, the thing just shot forward like a rocket, way he went, lifted off, gear coming up, about 70 feet, one engine quick, flipped over, dived into the ground and blew up. That was the first accident, the first loss out of their class from the time they'd started training. Fred's next. He said, I was sitting there, I was absolutely felt numb, dumbfounded, and I just kept saying to myself, surely they won't make me go ahead with this madness. And after a little while, he gets a clap on the head, the son says, come on, what the fuck are you waiting for? Get going. That was his very words. Get out there, lift off at 120, get your gear up, and throw it around a bit. So Fred got, his, got himself together, lined up on the runway, opened the taps, and he flew through a column of smoke that he said filled the cockpit, filled his mouth, filled his eyes, he couldn't see. And then when he got out the other end, the way he went, and he survived his first solo. But they lost quite a number more before finally 12 of those young men uh, got their wings. They were sent out to different operational squadrons. Within six months, there were two of them left alive. Six months. Fred was one of them. Another guy was uh, another one. Um, they both survived the war, luckily. So we go back now. That's Fred uh, about the time he graduated. Uh, 21 years old and uh, just glad to be around. So we'll now go back to our, our story. Now th these two young men that I've introduced you to didn't know, of course, one another. They met three times. The first time was when an, an airman was seen floating in a raft in that area off the coast of Sardinia. And the Americans had lost a few guys in the water and they hoped very much that that was one of their fellows. The, uh, the British had a couple of short Sunderlands operating from here, so they asked them would they go up and pick this guy up. Fred was sent as, with, with a wingman to do top cover for the Sunderland when they when he landed to pick up this airman. So they they met them up here. The Sunderland was pretty well armed and didn't really need uh, protection uh, while it was flying, but of course landing and taking off on the water, it was pretty vulnerable. So Fred and his mate flew up there, met them. The guy in the Sunderland landed and picked the young guy up, and Fred uh, radio down, uh, this is uh, doing up 5-2, Snoopy 2, Snoopy 2, how's our wet friend? And the guy came back and he said, and there was this wonderful British voice, he's, he's wet all right, but he's not one of ours, he's one of theirs. <laughs> so unfortunately it wasn't American and uh, that was that. As it turned out, unbeknown to the three Allied aircraft that were doing this rescue, above them were two ME-109s. And our friend Carl Muesner was leading that pair of ME-109s. He had left his, his base that morning, knowing that his mate had gone into the water over somewhere in that direction. They'd gone out, they'd found him, and they were they climbed up and were trying to get a German rescue aircraft, a rescue boat to come over and pick them up. But they, it was completely uh, useless. The Germans were tumbling out, the, out of Sicily with all their assets as hard as they could go and they weren't able to send a rescue operation. So they knew that when they when their fuel got critical and they had to go home, that young man was probably going to die. Then, they, of course, they see the Allied aircraft come along, and 
and uh, they see a man pick him up, they were pretty happy about that, so they didn't interfere. They let them uh, go off on their way, and they went off home. That was the first time. Second time wasn't all that, wasn't quite as good as that. Fred left his base and gr grouped up with a large number of aircraft, and they were going flying around here to attack the port of Palermo, which of course the Germans were using to get their assets off Sicily. And they were going to dive bomb hell out of the, uh, the harbour of, of Palermo. So when they, uh, w w what they used to do is that they had under, under wind tanks, which gave them, got them all the way to the target area, then they'd get rid of the tanks, and then they were, had full tanks to fight and go home. And Fred had just dropped his tanks when his wingman said, Hey boss, you're losing coolant out of your radio, what your right hand radiator. Fred looked at his instruments, his right hand engine was right up in the red, and he knew, he knew it was about to seize. So he closed it down and he headed off back in this direction, getting down low, hoping to be invisible. The aircraft was quite capable of flying on one engine. He could get home, no problem. His big problem was he had a pretty big area of water to fly over, and if he lost uh, an engine, he was in big trouble. And so he was concentrating on the, on the coast, looking for areas that he could, he could land uh, if he had to. And guess who spotted him? Our friend, Mr. Mielsner. He was a bit higher than Fred. He saw him, he saw an American aircraft in trouble, one engine operating. It could fly all right, but it couldn't fight on one engine. And he knew that he had an easy kill. He attacked from above, and he, his first salvo blew the operating engine to smithereens and had burst into flames. So Fred now is in a nine and a half ton glider, low height. What were his options? Option one, get out by parachute. Nobody at that stage had jumped out of a P-38 and survived. The, unfortunately, that, uh, that tailplane there copped you as you went out and it either cut you in half or did some terrible damage, and nobody at that stage had survived. So it wasn't, very, wasn't a very uh, good option, was it? So the uh, his second option, ditch. The P-38 acted like a submarine. When it hit the water, it had the big engines out the front, it had all its, all its uh, ordnance in front of the pilot, and generally when it hit the water, it just dived down and took the pilot with it. Not a, that second option wasn't a great one. Third one, should have been pretty good. I'll land on the beach. There was no beach. There were 50 foot cliffs right from that point, right down to here somewhere, going straight into deep water. Third option gone. He had no option there left but to try, remember he's down very low at the stage, to try and scrape over the hills, over the cliffs, and find somewhere to land pretty quick. And he was under 50 feet or so as he scraped over the hills, and all he could see was small farm fields with uh, stone fences around. Nowhere to put an aircraft down weighing nine and a half tonne and doing a hundred mile hour. So he knew immediately that he had a crash on his hands and he just kept the aircraft flying. Luckily, as he scraped over his last, uh, as your last fence, that flying tailplane, that tailplane between the two booms, hooked on the fence and uh, pulled that aircraft up from 
100 bowled out at zero, and the thing just dropped down into that little field, which was just impossible that that's what happened. By this time, the wing was burning fiercely, and of course he had full fuel. He'd only just got rid of his, under, uh, his belly tanks, and the thing was, and it was full of ammunition. It was going to blow. So Fred decided he'd better part company pretty quickly. He unbuckled his belt, jumped out, and he just ran. And he actually dived head first over the first, the closest uh, fence that he could come to, right into the arms of two Italian soldiers, who invited him to hand over his sidearm and said that they would see that he was nice and safe and comfortable. A, a, a funny part about it is Fred had suffered a bit of anti-Semitism in his own crowd, and in fact from one of the guys that was actually in his tent. And in, in defiance, he'd had a Star of David, a yellow Star of David, stitched onto his helmet, soft helmet in those days, they didn't have bone domes. And he'd forgotten, of course, that this was there in all the excitement. And he left it on, and uh, he still had his helmet on, and they took him, handed him on to the German patrol. Now, it's not a real, was a real good idea in 1943 to advertise you were Jewish and be handed over to the Germans. So it wasn't all, he wasn't all that comfortable about it once he realised it was still there. Anyway, they took him to a camp, a roundabout, that's where he crashed, there, he got right around to there when our friend found him, and just here somewhere, 30 mile north of the crash site, was a a, uh, a, a, a prisoner of war camp. Uh, our friend Carl, he stayed around. He wanted to make sure that that aircraft was destroyed, that he could claim it. The Germans claimed most things, whether, whether anyone saw it or not. But he could at least say, well, I saw it crash and burn. He saw the pilot get out. He saw the pilot take it into, into uh, custody by the Italians. And then he went off about his business, finished his, his trip and went back home. The first thing he did when he got home is he thought, I wonder if this American guy knows anything about my mate who was picked up. So he rang up and the camp and they said yes we've just taken in an american uh pilot and uh so he hopped in a motor car it was a fair trip he drove over right over there to meet fred when they they were both lieutenants both about the same age fred had been put into a a room no furniture just this room he'd been locked in this room he'd been in the air uh, for nearly three hours and he was walking around like this he was really uncomfortable he was dying for a twinkle and uh, he thought if I don't have one it's going to be an accident and then he thought I wonder if I could just go into the corner but he didn't want to upset the Germans he thought I've already seen the Star of David uh, I don't want to upset him anymore and so he was holding everything, and in walked this young German officer, Carl. They just, when they first met, Fred for an instant thought, I'm going to be interrogated here, and I've sent a guy in the same as me. The young guy came in, clicked his heels, uh, saluted him, and held his hand out, and they shook hands. The young man straight away said, have you heard of a German pilot that was picked up off the coast of Sardinia. And Fred said, yes, I was there. He said, he's fine. He wasn't injured. He's now a guest of the United States Army and he's very well looked after. And they chatted away. They immediately had some chemistry. They liked one another instantly and they just clicked. Anyway, not very long, he hadn't been there long, and they heard a group of trucks arrived, and they heard all this commotion where they started to load 
the prisoners into the trucks. And uh, they were getting them out of there to get them up and get them back to Germany to do a bit of work for the war, war cause. And uh, they, the, the commanding officer, uh, accompanied by two soldiers, arrived, come in the door, and he was rather peeved that one of his Luftwaffe officers was fraternising with the, jet, with the enemy. And he gave him a dressing down and sent him on his way. He saluted Fred again, turned around and walked out. But Fred was marched out, and because he was an officer, they were loading all the enlisted men first into the trucks, and they sat him down beside a fence post, still dying. Uh, anyway, they had only just started really loading when half a dozen P-38s arrived who had done their business in Palermo, some of Fred's friends, and they still had some ammo, and they decided that they were looking for a, looking for a target of opportunity, and what best, some nice big fat German trucks. So they immediately wheeled round and came in for a, a <coughs> strafing attack. There was hell to pay. Everybody just dived in all directions to try and get out of the road. The poor beggars that were in the trucks were jumping out and running in all directions. Fred just threw himself down on the ground and at that stage, nature took over. He said, he said it was the greatest twinkle he's ever had in his life. It just kept going and never stopped. And he hadn't unzipped or anything, it was just lying on his face in his flying suit. Anyway, they blew up a few of the trucks and then decided they were having a great time and they went round to make another pass. And Fred decided he was too close. If they hit the truck that was next to him, he was going to go with it. So he jumped up and he took off into a uh, olive grove. He ran into a few trees and threw himself down underneath an olive tree. The P-38s had a great time, and when they were finished, they flew off. And Fred then could hear the Germans uh, rounding up their, their uh, prisoners and start to load them in the trucks that were left. And he realised that nobody knew where he was. So he up and he ran and he took off in the opposite direction. He ran until he couldn't run another step, had a spell, got up and ran again. And three days and three nights, he had no food, no water. He, he lay hid up during the day, traveled at night, and he was eventually picked up by a British, uh, British patrol. They took him straight to a close airfield where there was a DC-3 just loading up. They put him in the DC-3 and the DC-3 dropped him off back in his unit. So that was a pretty good, uh, pretty good result. So then, as it turned out, Fred, when he went overseas, they had to do 25, uh, 25 missions and then they got back to the US. And Fred had got to 23, I think, and then they changed it to 50. So he was pretty peed off about that. But there's nothing he could do about it, and he started again. And on his uh, 49th, on his 50th mission, his commanding officer said, Freddie, we've got to get you home safely. What the, the Americans used to do is they, they would have an attacking force, and they would have three aircraft fly behind the attacking force as backups. And if an aircraft had engine trouble or mechanical trouble or for any other reason turned out of the force, one of these guys would go forward. And uh, one of them went forward until they got to, the, uh, got to the target area and Fred and his wingman turned for home. And Fred said it was the most wonderful thing. It was nearly as good as his twinkle. The feeling that he'd made it, he thought, everything was going fine. And they were flying along, and below them they came across five 
German transport. So I think they were Fokker 52s or something. Anyway, they were German transport, and you could see they were very heavily loaded. They were guarded by one ME109. And uh, they, he could see the people, they were close enough to see heads showing through the windows, loaded with human beings. Now Fred was that sort of guy. He said to me afterwards, he said, Murray, I could kill a man who was trying to kill me because I told myself I was just destroying an aeroplane. I had to, had to drive out of my mind that there was a man driving that aeroplane. If he got killed, that was tough luck because he was trying to kill me. But he said, I could not attack those aircraft that were defenceless. There was two of them, one in ME109, and he said, well, we could have got most of them, probably all of them, and there was probably 60 or 70 men in each aircraft. And so he decided they would not attack. He came under a great deal of stress from his wigman who wanted to get down there. He said, come on, boss, we're where here's an opportunity to get us three aircraft each. Uh, when does that come along? You know, this is a wonderful opportunity and Fred says, I order you to stay where you are. All of a sudden, a German voice came over the radio and he, this German guy had a, an allied radio fitted to his aeroplane. He caused a, caused a bit of havoc because he used to call break right, break right, and they'd break right into the front of him and he'd get a nice easy kill. Uh, but anyway, he, he said, doorknob 5-2, I, doorknob 5-2, I think that's you, Frederick Arnold. Why aren't you in Germany? And uh, Frederick came back and said, oh, he said, this is Carl Nielsen. And if you attack those aircraft, you know I could get at least one of you before I, I cop it. So uh, you'll better make up your mind. And Fred said, Carl, yes it is me. How the hell can you listen to our frequency? You don't have that on your radio. And that's what he said. I have a captured aircraft, a captured radio in my aircraft. And I've been listening to your conversation. It got very bit on the conversation. The two eyes, the uh, wingman had actually called him a yellow Jew B and uh, uh, the nose and how you never find a Jew anywhere near the scrap and all of these terrible things because he wanted to go down and attack these aircraft. Anyway, Fred stuck to his guns. So he said to Carl, Carl, I give you my word, we will not attack your aircraft. So, Milster, the, by this time, the, the five aircraft had got into line of stern, and he was protecting the last guy, because that's where the attack was going to come. If they attacked, they would attack the last man in the line until they got to the front one. And so he climbed up, and he set himself up, level with the back aircraft, 500 feet above and off to the right a little. And Fred and his wingman then climbed up and they were about 500 feet above him again and to the right. And they started talking. And Fred said he, it was a wonderful feeling because every time he said, saw an ME-109, he was scared out of his wits. That guy was going to attack him and he had to either get him or he was going to get killed. And it said to fly along beside this magnificent aeroplane, be able to have a good look at it and know that he wasn't in any danger. He said it was a wonderful experience. And he was really gazing at this aircraft when the, Japanese, when the German aircraft peeled off and dived. Fred looked back, his wingman had dropped back. When he got out of sight, dived down and he was in the act of shooting down the first of the five aircraft. And Fred said that he saw that aircraft break completely to half and spilling out of it were bodies like they were being poured out of a jug. And 
the aircraft started, of course, to, uh, to go down into the ocean. As the American, the other American was coming to line himself up to shoot the other next one, the, the German attacked him and he, his first salvo got the P-38 right in the passenger area, right in the, the uh, pilot area. The American was killed instantly. The aircraft turned over on its back and dived into the water, not very far from where his, his victim had died. Mules has said, Fred, I told you what would happen. And Fred, said, they, Fred was apologising, saying, you heard me order him not to do that. That was not my wish. And the guy said, well, look, I'm nearly out of fuel. You guys have held me around too long. I haven't got enough fuel to get home. If you want me to use the rest of my fuel fighting you, let's get to it, because otherwise I've got to go and find somewhere to land. Fred said, look, what about you bail out and I'll get an allied, uh, an allied PT boat to come out and pick you up. He said, I can't do that, Fred. I can't swim and I haven't got a life raft. So he said, OK, we've got a, we've got a, uh, they were, at this time, they were about here. And just here is an airstrip which uh, the Americans had been using earlier on before the Germans took over and he knew that the Americans had got some advanced aircraft there operating and he said I'll lead you into our airstrip I can't land it's too short for me but you can and if the fuel holds out you'll be safe I'll radio ahead everything will be fine so the German opened his guns up and fired all his ammunition. Fred said he could see the, the smoke and flame coming out of the guns as he emptied the aircraft of guns to get him down to the best way he could. And he set his aircraft up for endurance flying. And uh, Fred uh, came up alongside him. And that's that painting that you see, that depicts that moment when Fred came alongside. The uh, story goes on a little bit more. Uh, he couldn't raise the airstrip. And uh, he tried and tried. And then he got on to their area control, which was called washboard. Washboard, this is doing on 5-2. And he eventually got on him and said, look, he told them the situation. He had this German aircraft that he was trying to help to get down. And uh, they said, well, the aircraft that were there are gone. And there's a quadrant of British tanks have taken it over as their headquarters. I'll ring them through. They'll clear the strip, which has been, been uh, clogged up so that you couldn't be used. And you'll be OK. So Fred took up a position in front of, as they got close to the airfield, he took a position in front of the German aircraft. And I said to him, sitting in his lounge room once, I said, Fred, why did you do that? He said, I have asked myself that question so many times before, since the, the incident. But anyway, he lined up, the Germans behind him. As the German, he turned base, he could see out the back, he could see the German aircraft just coming up to the base point and his engine cut out. He'd run out of fuel. He was quite confident that the German could get the aircraft in. He wasn't worried about that. And the aircraft turned on base behind him and out of the corner of his eye, he saw a star coming up from either side. They were both direct hits and blew the German out of the sky. He disappeared. So that was a very, that was the end of the story that I wanted to tell you about. Uh, Fred was very upset. He actually said to me, he said, I look in the mirror and I see a murderer. And uh, that wasn't what I wanted it to be. But that's myself. That's myself, of course. 
you couldn't mistake me. Always in the limelight. Sitting in their lounge room in Encino in Los Angeles. That is the friend of mine who was a uh, Qantas captain, he's retired now. And there's Natalie, Fred's lady, who by the way, on her 85th birthday decided to do a parachute jump. <laughs> and there's Fred there. That was in 2004. I just recently, you know, almost last year, had 13, well, uh, had, uh, 13 days in Boulder in Colorado where they lived. They both, well, Fred turned 91 in, uh, in January and uh, I think Natalie's 87. But they're wonderful people. And I'm, I'm just going to say a little personal thing now because I'm pretty sure that when this is on YouTube, Freddie will get to look at it. So Freddie, if I've made any mistakes, if I've uh, told some things that are not quite true, they'll be treated the same as you treated me when I wanted to trade in my book that I read twice and had for 12 years and you refused to give me a refund. <laughs> Freddie, I love you all. You and Natalie, Mark, Barbara and the kids, Marcy and Dana and the kids. Love you all. I hope you enjoy this and I hope you people have enjoyed it as well. Thank you.